When does history begin? In the Michalisberg biosphere, the history of humanity goes right back to before the full evolution of human beings. And then it follows the sequence of rich history of Stone Age people, of settlers who brought cattle and culture into this region, on through the wars and the difficulties up until the present day. Hundreds of thousands of years of our turbulent past are embedded in the hills and valleys of this wonderful region. The southern part of the Michalisberg biosphere is the cradle of humankind World Heritage Site. And more fossil evidence of human origins has been discovered here than anywhere else in the world. Our human ancestors didn't only occur in the cradle, of course. They were distributed across southern and east Africa. But the unique chemistry of the Dolomitic caves that we described in one of our earlier talks meant that their skeletons were preserved in greater numbers here. The fossil discoveries are scattered over a timeline like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. One of the oldest was found in Sturkfontein Cave by Ron Clark. It's called Littlefoot and it's more than three million years old. But Sturkfontein first became famous in the 1940s when Robert Broom discovered a skull, now nicknamed Mrs. Pliss. It is a pre-human species called Australopithecus africanus and it existed two to two and a half million years ago. Lee Berger's discovery of Australopithecus sediba, that's another species, places that particular species less than two million years ago. And that's contemporary with, and perhaps competitive with, another hominid, Paranthropus robustus, and a much larger brain species, Homo habilis, which had the ability to craft elementary stone tools. Later came Homo ergaster, and it was this species that migrated from Africa to populate other continents throughout the world. A recent discovery of numerous skeletons of Homo naledi in what appears to be a mass burial site complicates the puzzle even further. And scientists at the Evolutionary Studies Institute at Witts University are trying to piece this complex puzzle together to explain the origins of our own species, Homo sapiens. The skill of toolmaking is the hallmark of human ancestry. And this primitive axe is one of many stone tools that are found in the Michalisberg region. Kruger Cave near the Olifansnek Dam was an important Stone Age gathering point and archaeologist Revel Mason found quantities of Stone Age and other artefacts there in 1977. Toolmaking became more refined about 40,000 years ago when spearheads were flaked off a coarse stone and bound onto shafts to make more effective hunting weapons. Later still, tools were further refined and they included poisoned arrowheads and bows, such as were used by the sand people until modern times. These ancient arrowheads and string from a bow were preserved in Kruger Cave and rediscovered by Revel Mason in the 1970s. Very different stone tools from that era were the bored stones, which were used to give impetus to digging sticks used by women to forage edible roots. But it's the exquisitely executed rock etchings that are, in my view, the most interesting Stone Age treasures in the Michalisberg. We actually know very little about them, but they may be thousands of years old and probably served a ritualistic function in hunter-gatherer communities. 1600 years ago, a new group of people migrated into the Michalisberg, shown in this drawing from Revel Mason's book. It's called the Early Iron Age because iron implements are distinctive artifacts from that time, but these people were also different because they farmed and kept cattle and they made a distinctive type of pottery. Archaeologist Tom Huffman traces their origins using language skills and pottery design, and he found that there were two migration routes. 
the Kalunda from the West Africa and the Kwali from East Africa. Husbanding livestock, instead of having to hunt and gather daily, allowed them a settled rather than a nomadic lifestyle. This is Revel Mason's reconstruction of their village on the Crocodile River near modern Brudestrum. They smelted iron for tools and weapons and they buried their dead ceremoniously, placing the heads of important personages in large pottery vessels close to the sacred iron furnaces. Cowrie shells and other items suggest some form of trade with the coast. And then, a thousand years later, a new wave of Iron Age settlers migrated into the Michalisburg from the west, the ancestors of the modern Botswana. Chieftainships splintered and regrouped under different leaders during the centuries that followed. New chiefs and groups split and spread further, and in about 1680, the Bafo King introduced the technique of dry stone wall building from the south. and the remnants of walled towns and villages can still be found over the entire Michalisburg biosphere region. Stone etchings of what appear to be ground plans of villages are found near some of the larger settlements. The houses were circular, they were supported by external wooden posts with a sliding wooden door, and the mud floors and the grooved door slides are visible at some of the old sites. Chanting women hoed the fields and they planted crops and grain was stored in wicker bins or otherwise underground. Another of Mason's drawings shows how the young boys who looked after the cattle drove them along walled passages to bring them into the village at night. Men were responsible for the almost sacred process of iron smelting and forging and elders held council over the affairs of the tribe in meetings of the Lekotla, a system of traditional government that continues even to this day. At the beginning of the 19th century, the tranquil life of the Botswana was destroyed by three devastating invasions. In 1823, the Bapedi were the first to invade from what is now in Pumalanga. Led by Malaku, son of the Pedi chief Sakwati, they swept through the Mahalisburg settlements, capturing cattle, women and children. The second invasion, this time by the Indibeli, was much more devastating. Mzilikatsi had defied Shaka's authority and he led his Kamalo people out of Zululand in 1821. For five years he conquered and absorbed victims of the Difakani, establishing a powerful migrant Ndebele kingdom when they reached the Vaal River, they were constantly harassed by Hrikwas and Karanas from the Northern Cape. So in 1827, the Indibeli moved north into the Mahalisburg, conquering each Tswana community in turn. First the Bakwena Makopo, the Bapo, the Bafokeng, the Bakwena Modimasana, and finally the Bakatla. Mohali, the chief of the Bapo, escaped to the Lesotho Highlands and he later played a significant role in our story. When Amotsona went to war, he carried long throwing spears and a traditional decorated stave and H-shaped shields. But these were no match for the Zulu stabbing spears and the full-length shields that they used. So the Botswana were subjugated and forced to bring tribute to the Indibeli king and that reduced them to abject poverty. They often survived only by robbing carrion from predators. Nzilikatsi established three huge military kraals in the Mahalisburg. This one, Dinaneni, was at what is now called Silkart's Neck, that's a corruption of Nzilikatsi's Neck. The kraals were of Zulu design, with a central cattle kraal surrounded by dwelling huts. From his three military bases, Kungweni, Dinaneni, and Tlatlandlela, Mzilikatsi ruled an empire from the Vaal River to the Limpopo. Mzilikatsi justified his very ruthless rule 
because he continued to be attacked by the Hrikwa and Karana from the west and by the Zulu army of Dingaan who had succeeded Chaka. So anyone that he suspected of dissidence was executed by clubbing or by drowning. In 1829, Mzilikatsi invited the missionary Robert Moffat to visit his powerful kingdom. Moffat had established a prosperous mission station at Kuruman and the Indibeli king was keen to learn more about things like irrigated canals and wheeled vehicles. At the time, the Mahalisberg range was called Khashwani or Kashan after the Bakwena chief who had ruled before Mzilikatsi. His name is commemorated today in the beautiful Khashwani mountain reserve. As Moffat approached the mountains, he witnessed people living in tree huts to escape lions. This is a somewhat fanciful drawing, but some say that part of the tree still exists on the farm Buchenhertfontein. And certainly the Bakwena did build elevated dwellings as protection against predators. Moffat rode alone into the great military kraal at Kungweni, and there he was encircled by an Indibeli impi. He stood his ground as they began chanting and dancing, and his courage endeared him to the king who was secretly watching. The consequent friendship that arose led to Mzilikatsi welcoming a large expedition from the Cape in 1835. It was led by Andrew Smith, a surgeon, scientist and explorer, and he was accompanied by Charles Bell and other artists who painted the pictures used in this talk to illustrate the life and landscape of Mzilikatsi's kingdom. They show the rich biodiversity, the manner in which the Botswana trapped game in pits and hunted larger animals, they depict the ornaments that people wore, how they made music, and how Mzilikatsi held audience with his visitors. Smith's expedition was followed the next year by a hunting trip by William Cornwallis Harris, and Mzilikatsi actually travelled for some distance in Cornwallis Harris's wagon. That visit coincided with the arrival of the four trekkers, who had not been sanctioned through Moffat's good offices. At the Battle of Fechkop, 40 Trekker families held off an attack by 4,000 Indibeli. But the Indibeli captured all of the Boer cattle, and oxen had to be borrowed from the Baralong to salvage the wagons. But that battle signalled the third invasion of the region and the end of the Indibeli rule. The following year, the Trekker leader Hendrik Potkita led a retaliatory commando of Boers, Hrikwas and Tswana and they destroyed the Indibeli strongholds. Mohali now played a major role fighting alongside the Boers to expel Mzilikatsi. He regained his ancestral lands with its sacred fountain at Majokoneng and the Boers named the mountain range after their Tswana ally and it's remained the Mohalisberg ever since. But the amicable relations deteriorated as Boers appropriated farms and required local Botswana to work for them. Robert Moffat's son-in-law, David Livingston, wrote, They, the Boers, have taken possession of nearly all of the fountains, and the natives live in the country only by, by sufferance. sufferance. Each chief, when called upon, is obliged to furnish the immigrants with as many men as any piece of work may require. And except in the case of shepherds, no wages are paid for labor. Labor is exacted as an equivalent of being allowed to live on the land of their forefathers. Paul Kruger owned two 3,000 hectare farms in the Mahalisberg. One is named after this waterfall on the farm and is now the waterfall shopping complex. The other is at Buchenhertfontein near Poking. Mohali himself was accused of gun running by the Boers and he then sought protection from the Basutu and he never returned. Later, Paul Kruger had the chief of the Bahatla, Hamanyani, publicly flogged for not sending men to work on the farms. 
Khamanyani took some of his people away to Moshudu, leaving others at Pilanisberg in defiance. And the Boer leaders were divided amongst themselves. Hendrik Portita, hero of the Battle of Fechkop, led one faction, and Andris Pretorius, hero of the Battle of Blood River, led another. There was a celebrated reconciliation in 1852, but the conflict flared up again after both leaders had died. The Boers were also divided in worship. The Dutch Reformed Church had not actually supported the Great Trek, and it was only in 1850 that the church town of Rustenburg was founded, and the first simple church was consecrated by Andrew Murray in 1851 and it was eventually replaced by the beautiful church that is there today. But the Boers were suspicious of the Cape influence and the Hervormde Kerk in HK broke away acrimoniously in 1853. Then in 1859, a group of Rustenburgers, including Paul Kruger, split off the Christelijke Hervormde Kerk or Doppe Kerk at a meeting under this tree. Pretoria was founded on neutral ground in 1855 by Martinus Pretorius, and it was named after his father, Andres Pretorius. But the churches remained separate until the late 19th century. And Pretorius also invited the Lutheran Hermansburg missionaries to work amongst the Botswana. The churches they built at Bethany and Kroondal are now historical treasures of the Machalisberg landscape. The British had granted the Boer Republic's independence in 1852, but 25 years later the Transvaal was bankrupt and unable to conclude a war with the petty chief Sekakuni. Theophilus Shepston annexed the Transvaal with the consent of President Burgers. Garrisons of British soldiers were stationed in Pretoria and Rustenburg and other outlying towns. Sekakuni was defeated by the British and brought triumphantly to Pretoria, and British immigrants like the remarkable Sarah Heckford settled on Machalisberg farms. But most of the Boers rejected the new regime, and at a meeting at what is now the Paderkral Monument in Krugersdorp, a triumvirate comprising Piet Joubert, Martinus Pretorius and Paul Kruger called for the restoration of independence. Sir Owen Lanyon, the High Commissioner in Pretoria, treated their demand with scorn and the First Anglo-Boer War broke out. Four days later, a British column was shot down at Bronkhorstbroet by Boer marksmen in just 15 minutes. Pretoria was besieged and fortifications were hastily built. The British sent out skirmishing parties and they defeated the Boers on Sammy Marx's farm but the siege was never lifted. In Rustenburg, the British garrison of 62 men defended an open, mud-walled fort just 22 metres square with the upper wall heightened by sandbags. And a local farmer, Martinus Russ, built this homemade cannon to shell the fort, but it did little harm and the British defence stood firm. A second gun was built by Russ in his farm shed, but it was never used, because after three months of siege behind a mud wall, the garrison learned that their defence had been in vain. The British had been defeated at the Battle of Majuba in Natal, and the war was over. Twenty years later, the Boers and Britain were at war again. The tragedies and triumphs of that war in the Machalisberg have been described in the previous talk in this series. The outcome was that the Boer Republics and the British colonies were united into a single country, South Africa, in 1910. And just four years later, they were at war again, this time against Germany. But to many Boers, fighting as an ally of Britain was anathema, and they rebelled. General Beyers, who had helped win the Battle of Neutgedacht in the Machalisberg, resigned as head of the new Defence Force and recruited a rebel commando at a Machalisberg stronghold. Smuts, who had fought alongside him at Neut Gedacht, sent emissaries to dissuade him, but without success. And Louis Boerter, the Prime Minister, 
and once Bayer's supreme commando in the South African War, then led a Union Army battalion to defeat him near Olifant's Neck. Bayer's escaped, but he drowned while trying to cross the Baal River. Yuppie Fouri, who had been appointed by Bayer's, was the only rebel to be executed for treason. As the 20th century progressed, the shadows of the past began to brighten. Plans for a large-scale dam on the Crocodile River had been initiated in 1907, but the First World War and the rebellion delayed construction until 1918. The dam was to serve the dual purpose of irrigation and a poverty relief for poor whites. 3,000 white labourers were employed on the site. But progress was beset with difficulties. Floods destroyed the early structures and in the harsh conditions in the labour camps, many died in the 1918 flu epidemic, too poor to have proper headstones. At last, the spectacular wall and the triumphal arch was completed in September 1923. In the following years, a vast canal system was completed to irrigate 15,000 hectares of farmland. And the excavation of the canals helped to reveal the mineral wealth along the rim of the Bushveld complex. In 1865, Karl Mach had discovered chrome in the area, but it was Hans Marensky who identified the Bushveld complex on the northern edge of the Mahalis biosphere and the richest known platinum deposits in the world. History has continued to be made in the Michalisberg in modern times. Nuclear weapons were secretly manufactured at Pellandaba in the 1980s, and the remoteness of the area offered sanctuary to people and activities in the fight against apartheid. Bram Fischer, a leading civil rights lawyer, took refuge on a farm near Rustenburg to escape persecution by the apartheid government and anti-apartheid activists maintain caches of arms and explosives at Bruderstrom for attacks on civilian and military targets. The AWB also made bombs in the Michalisberg and used them to try to disrupt the first democratic elections of 1994. The mines have brought prosperity to the people of the region, but they also brought tragedy with labour violence and the shooting of workers at Marikana in 2007. In this talk, we have covered a million years of tumultuous history. And whether our ancestors are in Guni or Twana or Brewer or British or anything else, we all have our roots in the Michalisberg somewhere. The past is the fabric from which our present lives have been fashioned. In the previous talks, we have looked at the geological and the natural wonders of the Michalisberg. And I hope that now that the region has been given international status as a biosphere reserve, that all of these things will be treasured by everyone who visits there. Mm -hmm.